Greetings and salutations, viewers and listeners out there. Welcome to Not The Word Ninjas Live podcast, because hey, it's a Monday. But hey, we just survived both Book Expo America and BookCon 2015. So seeing as I somehow survived all four and a half days of literary ridiculousness, I thought I'd do a quick review and then do the full book haul. That's kind of why my setup is slightly shifted more to the right of my desk as usual, because I am completely out of space here. I have, I believe, 46 books on this table, or desk, next to me that we get to go through. But first things first. Book Expo America 2015 was a blast. It was surprisingly well run. Now, I don't want that to be some sort of underhanded comment. It was for that amount of people, that amount of vendors, all the stuff that was going on, I was legitimately impressed at how smoothly everything was handled and how well they were able to accommodate that many people. I was impressed. And between, let's see, I don't even know how many vendors there were. I didn't think to count, but you had all of the big players, the big four, of course. You had all of you had a fair amount of imprints, a lot of smaller publishers, some standalone publishing company names, a lot of standalone authors, startups, a lot of good tech companies there this year. A lot of interesting people to talk to. We all had a lot of fun. Those were those who were able to go, myself, Calvin, and Justin. And we did get, I believe, eight interviews on Friday that are going to be going up throughout this week once they're fully edited and prepped and posted and all that fun stuff. But yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. It was very well done. I got to see a lot of old friends from last year, make some new friends, there's a lot of good networking stuff that we got going that I hope will now be filled for the next few months with potential interviews once we get oh, that networking train rolling. Because, no, my, my pop filter is kind of blocking, but over on my shelf back that way, there's a stack about this high of business cards and flyers and uh, book catalogs from various publishers that we need to sift through and start making contacts with and scheduling stuff going forward. A lot to do. And that's just mostly Book Expo. Book Con. Okay, so Book Expo was Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, and Friday. Two and a half days, a lot of fun. Book Con was Saturday and Sunday. Now, whereas where Book Expo is primarily for those in the industry, like we were able to go as a retailer because we're an e-retailer uh, legally so that we can sell our shiny baubles and whatnot at conventions. For BookCon, it's basically open to the public. Anyone willing to pay the price of like $35 for a badge is able to go. Nice and easy. A lot of fun. Book Expo... I'm keep going back because I want to do comparisons. I'll get to that. Book Expo had twice the amount of space because they really went all out. You had everything there. BookCon had half of the convention space on the upper floor and then a lot of the meeting rooms downstairs for panels and whatnot. Book Expo's lines for like autograph session sessions or at the booth autograph signings were surprisingly well run considering the amount of people who waited in those lines. Like they really figured out how to keep traffic flowing through the aisles, how to snake the lines around turns and towards the edges so that even if people were waiting for an hour before a signing and you had 100, 200, 300 people in line, they still made it work, which was fantastic. Like there were a few book signings I believe Thursday, where I waited a uh, solid hour and a half for one particular book. At, like 45 minutes before the book signing was supposed to start, I got in line and I was already like 75 people back or something ridiculous like that. I thought that was dedication. BookCon put that to shame. 
the people in the industry have priorities. A more either you're there for networking, so you're going from not quite sure what that is. Sorry. You're going from contact to contact that you're aiming to talk to because you have a whole thing set out. Or you're there to get galleys and arcs and signings and stuff for whatever it is you do, whether you're a blogger, you're a librarian, you're a retailer, you're a wholesaler, whatever your deal is, you have priorities. BookCon is open to the public. So the public has a significantly different priority set than those in the industry. I did not take that into consideration. BookCon was ridiculous in that you show up at, say, 8 o'clock in the morning. The exhibit hall opens at 10. The signings and stuff start a little later. To get books signed for BookCon, you had to go to the bookstore. So they just had a whole row of tables lined up with all the books that are going to be signed at the autograph tables. In concept, that seemed like a very smooth way of doing it. Like all of the books are there. You can see all the stuff that's going to be signed. So you'll, you can just grab all of them in one go and then get them signed as, you, as the time allows. Where it slightly fell apart or became complicated is that everyone went to get the books first thing Saturday morning. Because you think, OK, if you have 10 books you want signed, say, go all out, 10 books throughout Saturday and Sunday, you can get all 10 Saturday morning. Do it first thing, and then you're free to wander and do whatever you want the rest of the weekend. If everyone does that, there's going to be a mob in front of the bookstore while everyone tries to do that. So you would think, OK, well, create a long snaking line or something space efficient to manage all those people. I don't know what the system was. I don't know how prepared they were or what didn't quite work. But we get there. We line up to get into the exhibit hall. They clear out that room so that entire line of people who want to go upstairs or do stuff so that they can empty the room out. I would think for like uh, fire and safety code reasons, just because there was so many people. I can't fault them on that. It would it made sense to clear out the room. But we wanted to go back to go to the bookstore to get books. By the time we managed to get over there, there was already a mob of about 100 people waiting to get to the bookstore to buy and get all the books they wanted. There was no rope or... Uh, barriers or anything to create a line that's where it fell apart for that part it sincerely hope well for sunday they figured that out and prepped ahead of time so thankfully they managed to adapt on the fly but it took them a while to create a line for all the people who were there and figure out some sense of order to make that all work so thankfully they were able to get it going and sorry, I'm just checking notifications to make sure that nothing too important about this is going on right now, but it looks like I'm safe. But yeah, the bookstore was the biggest complication from BookCon that I saw in that it took a complicated amount of time to get the books that you wanted to get signed. Excuse me. And I think another factor was they communicated in such a way as to say, even if you already own a copy of this book or you want something other than their newest book signed, you still got to buy the book. I understand part of the logistics of that, so I don't really want to fault them on that. But when it's also, when that is the communication, and the reality is a majority of the authors, if you come with another book of theirs, or something else of theirs that you want signed, a majority of them are perfectly happy and willing to sign that book or that poster or whatever piece that you happen to bring that is of theirs. That I hope they communicate better next year because that was very that was a very big disconnect for a lot of people, which caused a lot of frustrations from what I saw, which is a shame because 
book con like book expo people in the industry have a certain set of priorities and expectations and levels of patience for when things go funky the general public if you're there for say five signings even if you're in the bookstore line to get the books to get signed until 11 30 or 12 even but the book signings from 11 to 12 and the line already started for the book signing before you even get the book I can see how people would get a little upset and discouraged and disappointed and frustrated and everything. We experienced some of those for just other book signings. Like we would show up two to two and a half hours early for a autograph table book signing and the line was already capped. That is frustrating, but I can't really fault the staff for too much for that because there's only so much you can do about that and i am impressed by the dedication that a lot of fans have for some of their favorite authors to actually prioritize certain books and panels and stuff to the point where you are willing to sit and wait in a line for two to two and a half to three hours sometimes to get the wristband the book the signing the panel whatever I'm amazed by the people who are willing to do that. If that is your priority for the day, good for you. I sincerely hope that those who did that were able to get into the panels and the book signings and all the stuff they wanted to do. I am not that dedicated. I'm just not. I would much rather be able to wander the floor and see more of the panels and uh, booths and everything then sit in a line for two and a half hours reading one of the various books that i have for that one book now i say that but say if well not really possible now but say if terry pratchett were signing a book or douglas adams or for me david eddings if one of the biggest authors of my life or childhood one of the more significant ones were there. Okay, yeah, I would fight for it. I would be passionate enough to sit and wait in that line because that would take priority. So for those who attended BookCon who did that for those types of reasons, good on you. I sincerely hope you got into the panels and signings that you wanted because if it's that level, it is worth it. The bad news across both conventions at least for us or for me is next year apparently both book expo america and book con is going to be in chicago now i love chicago chicago's a lot of fun and there's a lot of fantastic things to do in chicago alongside book conventions and the like but the draw of new york for me is i'm based out of connecticut it's just a train ride away so yeah, granted, okay, fine. It's about two hours door to door from like my house to the convention center in Manhattan when you factor in like tra driving to train station, train station, train station to convention center, all that. Like, fine. Four hours a day of travel for something like that, I can live with. Chicago, though, that's a very significant investment to catch a flight that will actually get me there on time because i do not have good luck with air flight air flights or flights in general not just air flights i think those really are the only flights out there i'm rambling yeah i just don't have good luck with planes airports all that stuff i don't trust them because i'm always screwed one way or the other so flying there is going would be complicated plus the hotel that would be necessary because you can't fly back and forth every single day, plus the cost of shipping because I don't want to bring two suitcases just so I can fill one with books and then pay whatever exorbitant price there is for a 75-pound, excuse me, 75-pound suitcase. That, that would just not be fun times. So 
Next year, I don't know if we're going to Book Expo or Book Con simply because of the travel logistics involved. Now that is now if we were to get press badges, that would give us a specific purpose for going there beyond just general networking and our own entertainment and shenaniganry. If we got press badges, we could do a lot for all of you. That would make it worth it. We would gladly invest the money to travel and attend and get interviews, get video recordings of some of the panels that we're allowed to record, all that good stuff for all of you. That I would do. But if it's just for us and what little we can do without press badges, that's going to be a hard sell, I have to admit. But thankfully, we have a year to figure all that out. So hopefully by then, we'll have a plan of attack for either attending it in some way, shape, or form that is worth the investment, or we figure out alternatives to network with those people who would attend or some of the publishing companies we've made friends with, as I'll go through their book halls soon. So yeah, Book Expo was a fantastic time. If you're able to attend it via whatever method you can, I would highly recommend it. If the travel is worth the investment for you, for a book con, if you can attend it, I highly recommend it because it is a lot of fun. But just be aware that Book Expo, you're in the industry, so you don't have to, you only have to combat those also in the industry. And we're all more or less capable of only going into a line one hour beforehand, not two or three hours beforehand. So you can fit a lot more going in. BookCon, if you want a specific book signed or if you're going for a specific panel, you're going to have to go in knowing, figure out just how early people are lining up and either commit or accept that you can do more in those three hours of waiting in a line, just being out on the show floor, talking to other publishers, finding new publishers and authors to appreciate and read and enjoy than sitting in that one line. But if that one line is what you are passionate about for that author, publisher, vlogger, whatever, go for it. Whatever it is you want to do to get the most fun out of it, by all means, go for it. Just keeping in mind that it's going to be an inve a time investment in that case. Because people say print is dead. BookCon shows that it is alive and thriving and incredibly dedicated. Like I was blown away at the dedication of some of these people out there for their favorite authors and vloggers. The vloggers from Book Expo, I admit I don't know them. It's probably because I am outside of their target demographic. But if they are able to inspire regular people or just other people, doesn't, doesn't have to be regular people, just other people to read and appreciate books and literature and all that, more power to you. Keep doing what you do. I don't know you. You're probably not for me because I'm outside of your target demographic. And that's fine. I'm willing to accept that. I'm old. I'm 29 going on 92 most days. But if you can inspire other people to appreciate literature, keep going. Do whatever you can do, because it is well worth it. All right, enough rambling. On to the book haul, which is scary and intimidating, because I had four and a half days to acquire books. And a, more, uh, a majority of them were ARCs, advanced reader copies, or just galleys. So I have a lot. I think I have about 46. I'll... Let's see if we can count while we go. But I wanted to start things off with some friends from last year. Spencer Hill Press was there again. I did not originally expect them to be there because they were under, I believe it was mid-trade presses or mid-point presses. It was a conglomerate of mid-level publishing companies. In, I'd say there were about 10 of them give or take, but the 
website and the app for Book Expo only had the midpoint or mid-level press name. They didn't have the individual organizations within it. So I couldn't search for them. I didn't know they were there until I was wandering through and like, I recognize that sign. I recognize that press. Hey, I recognize those people. That's awesome. Which means that I got to get some books from Spencer Hill Press again. And I really hope that we get to coordinate some more interviews because they are a blast to talk to. Now, kicking things off is uh, one of the authors that we actually got to interview last year, Lisa Amowitz, was there. We actually interviewed her about her book cover artistry. But she's also an author under Spencer Hill Press. And we managed to get a copy of Until Beth which is an arc, and it is signed, I believe. Yep. Ah, runaway paper. She was very nice enough to sign it for us. So I hope to, excuse me again, I hope to get her on the show to talk about this one because this is her latest one out. And we also managed to get a copy of The Beast of Seaborn by Reese A. Jones which is the second book in this series. Unfortunately, I haven't acquired the first book yet, so this one's going to go slightly lower in my reading pile until I can acquire the first one, because I want to read them in order. We also have The Stag Lord by Darby K, which is the uh, pseudonym for one of their authors. It's Darby... Darby... I'm blanking on the other name for the other pseudonym, but Darby K is the pseudonym for when this person writes more adult literature or something not necessarily falling under the YA arc. So this one I heard was very interesting, and I'm excited to get to that one. We also got Play On by Michelle Smith. This is one of the first books I got at Book Expo, and I finished it in under 24 hours. I'll do a full... Um, book review on this. Yes, we're doing book reviews again. We're actually getting back on that. I'm going to do a book review on this one for this Friday, which is the 4th? 5th. 5th. Yeah. I'll be doing a book review on that, so look forward to it. And yeah, they are a lot of fun. They're a blast to talk to. I really look forward to reading them and talking to the authors more and getting them on the show on Wednesdays so we can learn more about the books and what else they're up to, all that good stuff. Now, our, let's see. We're going to be kind of jumping around because of how I organize these. There's theoretically some sense of order to this, but not quite. Some new friends we got this year are from Waldorf Publishing. Now, these are some fantastic people. We had a blast with them on Friday. Oh, they were fun. We actually got six or seven interviews out of them on Friday. We were just constantly going back to them like every couple hours for one more of their authors to talk about their latest book. And it was just so much fun. So we have a whole stack from them. Now, let's see here. We have 10 Bits of Wisdom from The Shoeshine Guy by John Early, which looked like a lot of fun. Unfortunately, he was not there to interview, but I hope potentially we'll be able to get him on in the future. Our first interview of the day was with Charles Connor for the book Keep a Knockin', the story of a legendary drummer. Now, we originally put this on the list of people we want to talk to because I thought a musical book, a drummer, I'm sold, that's going to be fun. And I know Calvin will appreciate it as a musician. It'll be a nice diversity for just our regular fantasy books and all that. He was the freaking drummer for Rich, uh, Little Richard or Little Richie. Like That's freaking awesome. And he was so much fun to talk to. I'd love to get him on a show just to talk to him again some more because the stories he can tell. I know this is going to be a hilarious book. I really look forward to it. Let's see. You also got How to Get People to Scream Your Name and Beg for More. The Peas and Keys to Living the Ultimate Life by Tom Morrison. 
we managed to interview him as well, and he was a lot of fun to talk to. We had a lot of good discussion with him. I'm presuming that these are going to be put up in order of when we interviewed them. So I think logistically, it's going to be Charles Connor, then Tom Morrison. Then the next one was Jason Vines, who wrote, What Did Jesus Drive? Crisis PR in Cars, Computers, and Christianity. And one minor spoiler, Jesus doesn't really show up that much in this book because, as he put it in the interview, so you'll see that soon enough, so not really spoilers, Jesus drove the truth, which I believe is not the name of any particular car out there currently or in the past. Now, hopefully no car maker in the future makes a car called The Truth, because that would be annoying and kind of throw this off. And he also is coming out with a book called Jimmy Hoffa Called My Mom a Bitch, which is more of a compilation of the political blog that he was working on and a lot of the articles from there which sounds hilarious because it really covers the entire spread of ridiculous stupidity that happens in humanity. It's almost the Darwin Awards of politics, but without death. So all the stupid mistakes that people do, like, that one's going to be fun to read through. I'm going to have fun with that. Let's put those down. And unfortunately, and we did get some other interviews with them but I do not have their books on hand, unfortunately. We might be able to get copies in the future, hopefully, to read, but look forward throughout this week and maybe part of next for all the fun interviews that we got done. All right. Let's see. Yeah. So, let's see. That's not quite a new friend yet, but it would be awesome if they were. Let's go with another old friend in Michael Kep, who came out with his second book in the New Earth mythology, Leaves of Fire. I really look forward to this one. Oh, he is so much fun to talk to. I was really happy to see him on the autograph signing list because he didn't have a booth there. So I was worried we wouldn't be able to see him for a while or talk about his next book, but he was signing the new book there. So I managed to talk to him for a little bit and catch up. And he actually gave us not one, but two signed copies of the second book. So we'll be giving those away at some point. I'm still working on the logistics for that, but of course, keep an eye out. We'll keep you informed. I really look forward to this one, and I know we're going to get him on the show again to talk about it and how it ties into the second one and maybe what's coming up for the third one when that eventually comes out, hopefully next year. But yeah, I was really happy to see him on that list. It made my day. And we also, although we didn't get to interview her last year, we did talk for a while with Nancy Nagel, who this year came out with Mint Juleps and Justice, an Adams Grove novel. And we managed to act last year she was giving out a tiny little book preview, like a couple chapters or so. And this time around, she managed to give us the full book. So I'm excited to read this and get her on the show to talk about it. It'll be a lot of fun. And I managed to make friends with Jay Bean Palmer and Chris Palmer, who are a couple who are writing a series of young adult and middle, middle school age books. And we managed to get a copy of the third book for the Cape Cod Witch series. This one is called Elsbeth and the Call of Castle Ghosties. Ah, runaway paper. And this is another signed copy that we managed to get from both authors. And I'm going to hopefully get the other two in this series so I can do like the full trilogy review at some point in the near future and get them on. Because I love Cape Cod books. Cape Cod books are a blast. And the premise of this one sounded really interesting. So I'm going to have fun with this one and getting them on in the future. 
I also managed to talk to Celia May, Celia Mai. I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name. I'm really bad with that. This is Other Side of the Wormhole, which is actually book one of two. And another signed copy that we'll be giving away eventually after we read and review it. I'd love to get her on the show because the premise of this one also sounds interesting. All of these books are interesting. So we're going to have a blast reading through all of them. It may take us a little while. I'm sorry. There's just so many to get through, as you'll see. But yeah, she was a lot of fun to talk to. And there's another book in this series that we're going to have to get at some point so we can talk about how they both play together. See, this one was, uh, I haven't been doing the publishers, uh, even though I organized them by publisher. Sorry about that. But I mean, we had, let's see. This one is from Dragon's Den, Pu Dragon's Den Publishing. Uh, let's see here. The Elspeth was from Holly Hill Press. Mint Julep and Justice was Mont Lake, Mont Lake Romance. Let's enunciate. Leaves of Fire by Michael, Michael Kep is Will Dreamly Arts. And the next one, next ones up are from a fun little publishing group that we met at BookCon, actually, for, from UFO Publishing. Now, what caught my eye first was Explaining Cthulhu to Grandma and Other Stories by Alex, Alex Schwartzman. Um, I'm butchering that last name as well, I'm sure. But this one looks like a lot of fun. It's not Lovecraftian so much as parody. And I'm all about parody. That's that's going to be such a fun read. And he was interested in being on the show and getting interviewed and talking about all this stuff. So we're excited to eventually coordinate that. And he also edited a compilation that apparently has never been done before from what he could see or what he could find, and thinking about it, and even doing just brief research, he was right. We have Coffee, 14 Caffeinated Tales of the Fantastic. How has there not been a compilation of coffee stories yet? I'm curious to read this one just to see what what's in here, and why has it not been done before? Because, I mean, really, it's coffee. How can you not have a compilation of coffee? You have enough on cats. You have enough on other animals and foods and everything, but not coffee? Blasphemy. Let's see. And the last one on this pile, there's three more to go, was over from Harper Perennial. This is the one that I waited almost two line or two hours in line for because I'm a fan of the podcast. I'm really intrigued by what the book was going to be. So we have Welcome to Night Vale from Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner, which I managed to get signed by both of them who were there. And I didn't get to talk to them, unfortunately, because book signing, there were like 300 people behind me. But someday, someday it would be nice to actually talk to them the people on that podcast because they are incredibly fun people and I was not fighting for that panel I fought for the book I'm content with the book I'm a, I'm already that f I'm like a th more than a third of the way through the book and having a blast with it I'm I'm willing to accept that I wasn't going to fight for the panel to get to listen to them talk about the book and all that so this is this was fun. This was worth it. That'll probably be the next one that I finish. So probably next Friday will be a review on that. No spoilers or anything because it doesn't come out until October. But yeah, that's the next one I'm probably going to finish. Now, how to do this? There were a lot of standalone authors. So let's go through them. We have... Stephanie Bond's Seven Brides for Seven Bodies, which we managed to get autographed. And it even came with a little fun little charm and bookmark and shiny bauble and whatnot. 
So I'm excited to read that. She was a very nice person to talk to. We have Reconstruction, First a Body, Then a Life by Ara Lucia Ashburn with Michael J. Ashburn. Let's put that up on the screen. Also signed. What caught my eye was mainly the cover art because this was very nicely done. Minimalist design, but it still catches your eye. And the premise of the story also was interesting once I managed to read more. So that's going to be fun. Like I said, they're all going to be fun. I keep saying that, but yeah. Oh. Ah, sorry about that. Knocked my pop filter. That was inevitable. It's just in the way now. I'm not used to it. We have five nincompoops, the princess and one savior. How it all went down by Kay Edward, which is a nice little read. Unfortunately, this one is not signed, but still looking forward to reading and reviewing. A lot of these you might have recognized from the uh, last week's episode of the podcast because some of these are from book or day one from Book Expo America. There are repeats because, hey, we already covered like 15 books, but I'm just doing them all. So we have Morning with the Masters, Mystical Journeys in a Postmodern World by Carol E. Richardson, which was also from day one. So if you saw last week's podcast, this one will be familiar. We have... I Can Give You Anything But Love by Gary Indiana. I believe this was one of the galleys or just book drops because I don't have an interesting story about this one, unfortunately. But it is a long-awaited memoir from one of the most acclaimed radical writers in American literature, which is probably what caught my eye. So, one more book to read. Of course, we have The Stages of Grace by Connie Rubin and Kate O'Neill. And we have Run to Live by Greg Spagna, which was also from day one. Oh, God, there's more. So many books. All right, well... What was this pile? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. What else is in here? Why? Oh, okay. I have notes here of what's in each pile, but I think some got shifted around. All right. On, what was that? Thursday, I managed to catch a panel of tour authors, which was a blast and hilarious and so much fun. Two of the authors on that panel were doing a book signing shortly after, and I managed to get both books. We have Updraft by Fran Wild, which is right up my alley. I really look forward to this one. Not, be not only because of the premise, but I mean, it's from Tor. I have never been disappointed by a Tor book. So that's going to be a little higher up on the reading pile, to be perfectly honest. We also have Barsk, The Elephant's Graveyard by Lawrence M. Schoen, also from Tor. He was also a lot of fun to listen to. So those are going to be a little higher up on the reading pile, most likely, just because I need some more sci-fi and steampunk in my life. And from Penguin Random House... I'm just lumping all of their imprints and stuff together just for lo organizing logistics. Let's put this pile over here. We have Nightbird by Alice Hoffman, which has a lovely little cover and is signed. We have The Swans of Fifth Avenue by Melanie Benjamin, who is apparently also the author of The Aviator's Wife. So cool. I haven't gotten to The Aviator's right, Wife, but I have heard good things about it, so I'm excited to have this in my pile. I, hey, let's actually show the book rather than just talk about it, huh? 
this was a galley drop that i mean the cover caught my eye and then i saw read a bit of the back so i'm intrigued this is voyagers book one project alpha by dj McHale, and apparently it's part one of a six book series at the moment this one coming out september of this year and expanding the next year and a half pretty much for release dates for the next five but it looks like a fun little either middle school or early ya series from what i can vaguely tell just from skimming through it so that's going to be fun another author that i didn't realize was going to be at BookCon, but made me really happy because i loved the first book of the trilogy was frank bedor who wrote the looking glass wars now i i got book one as a hardcover for one dollar from book off in uh, manhattan because it looked intriguing it had fun cover art it had an interesting premise i thought an alice in wonderland retelling i'm in and i got hooked but i could never find the next two books but then he had a booth he had a table. He had all the books, plus the new graphic novels for the Hatter Madigan story. I was excited. I was almost downright giddy. So I managed to get a signed copy of the second book, Seeing Red, and the third book, Arch Enemy. Those are also going to be somewhat high up on my list, along with the first book, because it's been a while since I read that one, and I kind of forget some of the details, so... That's going to be fun to review. I would love to get him on the show because he was a lot of fun to just talk to for those five minutes or so. And I have a feeling that he is definitely our type of weird and right up our proverbial alley. So I'm definitely going to be trying to get in touch with him or his uh, PR agent, whatever we can do for that. Okay. Hopefully those don't fall over because now they're in two very tall piles. We only got one stack left, but it's a little chaotic. All right, we have Your Heart is a Muscle the Size of a Fist by Sunil Yaba. I think these are the ones where I only had one or two from each publishing company, so they just kind of stacked together. This one is from, come on, it was right there. I know I saw it. I know I saw it. Oh, yeah, Little Brown and Company. Little Brown and Company is another one that I'd love to get to know more about because I kept seeing interesting books from them and interesting cover art, a lot of book drops, book signings. They were busy this entire week. So I'd love to get to learn more about that group and what they have to offer because reasons. We have The Ohm Factor. A Women's Spiritual Guide to Leadership, Seven Essential Tools, and Seven Key Traits to Cultivate for Your Success and Well-Being by Alka Dillian, who seemed like a very fun author to talk to. And while it is primarily a women's spiritual guide, anyone is allowed to read it. She even stated so to various people in line. So I have no qualms about reading this myself, even though I am clearly not a woman or a girl, or female in general. We have The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Um, I just don't know. Oh yeah, from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I think this was the only one I managed to get from that publishing. Oh, shiny, shiny. You can kind of see it. So much reflection. Apparently, this is a very good little story that I'm strongly encouraged to read, as many people have told me. Uh, the next two are purely just from my personal enjoyment, but from Quirk Press, who I enjoy and appreciate because of some of the uh, parody stories they've done. They managed, they were giving out or selling Night of the Living Trekkie or Trekkies. With, uh, by Kevin David Anderson and Sam Stahl. This one looks like it's a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to reading this one. 
because it is going to be silly. And because I am a Trekkie, I managed to also get The Wit and Wisdom of Star Trek by Rob Perlman, which is a fun little book, which is mostly just little quotes and imagery and stuff from the shows. So that's going to be a fun little quick read. I managed to get this one signed and personalized because I don't want to give this one away. This, one, this one's mine. I'm not sharing this one. I'll do a book review and most likely recommend it to other readers who appreciate Star Trek and such things, but that one's mine. Let's see here. We also have Black Tide by P Patrick Freivald, a Matt Rowley novel which is from Journal Stone, which I'm not familiar with. So there's a whole list of ones here where I have one or two from odd publishing companies I'm not overly familiar with, where we're going to do our research, do some digging, see what else they have to offer, and try and do some networking. That is one of them. Let's see, we have Rememberers, an urban fantasy novel, which I'm always up for, by C. Edward Baldwin. Managed to get this one signed. And I didn't write a note of the pub. Oh, Ink and Stone Publishing. Another one I'm not familiar with. May just be for that particular author, because I know there are some authors out there who just create their own little publishing name so that they can do it under that method. We have The Perilous Journey of the Not So in Innocuous Girl. Helps if I read the title correctly, by Leigh Statham, which we also managed to get signed from Month 9 Books, who also sounds like a fun group to get to talk to in the future, and I hope we manage to network with them. This was one that I was excited to read, so that's probably also going to be higher up on the list somehow. So many of these books I want to be high up on the reading list. I don't know how that's going to work, because I can only read one at a time, really. We also have The Diet Myth, Why the Secret to Health and Weight Loss is Already in Your Gut by Tim Spector. This was over from The Overlook Press, another one we really want to talk to because they were a lot of fun to talk to when we were able to get over there. And they had a whole diverse array of stuff to offer for books. So that's another one we're really going to focus on in during this year to try and get more from and talk to and all that good stuff. We also have Me and Earl and the Dying Girl by Jesse Andrews from Amulet Books. It's one of the Abrams imprint. I'm not really familiar with this one, but I've heard a lot of people talking about it over the weekend, so I'm, I'm intrigued. And... The last one that I got is The Magician's Lie by Greer McAllister, which is a nice-sized hardcover from Sourcebooks Landmark. Another one that I don't really know much about, but the cover art definitely catches my eye. I like magicians. I like magicians who lie because they usually have interesting stories. So, hey, I'm adding it to the pile. That is everything I got from Book Expo America and BookCon 2015. And if you follow social media, or at least, let's see. No, it's probably mostly on my social media. I don't think I connected it to the FC Writers Tumblr. I did a full book purging of my To Be Read pile, not, not including any of these, just stuff that I had before this. Uh, I think I put, looking at that pile, over 100 books in boxes to be brought to the library and used bookstores because I sincerely know that I'm not going to get to them ever. Because at the rate that I acquire books like this, I'm just never going to get to them, not with the amount of reading time that I have or lack thereof. So I've whittled down my to-be-read pile probably by about a third. I mean, I still have probably a solid 100 to 150, 
books on my to be read shelf, not including like the approximately 50 I have now to read and review, plus whatever else we get from these fantastic publishers and authors. So at least I have space for the new ones now. That's good. That's helpful. But it was hard. Like, I don't like admitting that I am not going to end up reading a book or that it sounded interesting at one point, but I'm just, some of them I would have to be in the right mood to read, and I'm so rarely in that mood when I'm not already reading something else. I had to just admit it and put them downstairs so that they can be brought to the library to use bookstores and be shared with people who will read them in a timely manner. So that's that. I really don't know how I'm going to prioritize these. Like, just looking at the three stacks I have now, it's going to take a while. Plus, whatever new stuff we get on top of it all, I may be delegating some of these to our crew if they're interested in any of them. And because of all these books that are arcs and not quite out yet or coming out, we're going to try and power through these as best we can so that we can review them and give them away because we enjoy giving these books away, especially the signed ones, because we like sharing with our viewers and listeners. We like engaging with all of you. And we now have a lot of things to share with you. Like, admittedly, there are about five or so of these books that I got personalized just because I really wanted a copy of them for myself. Those I obviously will hold on to for myself. But there's a good 40, 45 books that we are going to be giving away over the rest of the year. And at conventions, we're going to have a book box at our booths, most likely, for if you purchase something, you get to go through the box and grab one item. It can be a book. It can be a bookmark. It can be a shiny bauble from one of the vendors that we visited. Like We have all sorts of interesting things in that box now, thanks to Book Expo and BookCon. So look forward to that. Keep an eye out. Again, all the interviews that we got over the course of Friday will be put up throughout this week and next, probably one a day, maybe two a day, depending on how quickly we can get them edited. And we are going back into full book review mode starting this week. So come back Friday for my review of Play On and Next Friday, I'm sure I'll be done with Welcome to Night Vale's book because I'm just having so much fun with that. I'm sure I'll finish it. Maybe even on the train tomorrow, knowing me. But yeah. Thank you for joining me and listening to me rambling for almost an entire hour about books and book conventions and all that fun. And I'll see you all next time. Have a good night, everyone. Or good morning whatever time it happens to be for you when you're viewing this. Ta-ta. Amount of imprints, a lot of smaller publishers, some standalone publishing company names, a lot of standalone authors, startups, a lot of good tech companies there this year. A lot of interesting people to talk to. We all had a lot of fun. Those were those who were able to go, myself, Calvin, and Justin. And we did get, I believe, eight interviews on Friday that are going to be going up throughout this week once they're fully edited and prepped and posted and all that fun stuff. But yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. It was very well done. I got to see a lot of old friends from last year, make some new friends. There's a lot of good networking stuff that we got going that I hope will now be filled for the next few months with potential interviews once we get that networking train rolling. Because, no, my, my pop filter is kind of blocking, but over on my shelf back that way, there's a stack about this high of business cards and flyers and uh, book catalogs from various publishers that we need to sift through and start making contacts with and scheduling stuff going forward. A lot to do. And that's just mostly Book Expo. Book Con 
Okay, so Book Expo was Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, and Friday. Two and a half days, a lot of fun. Book Con was Saturday and Sunday. Now, whereas where Book Expo is primarily for those in the industry, like we were able to go as a retailer because we're an e-retailer uh, legally so that we can sell our shiny baubles and whatnot at conventions. For Book Con, it's basically open to the public. Anyone willing to pay the price of like $35 for a badge is able to go. Nice and easy. A lot of fun. Book Expo... I am keep going back because I want to do comparisons. I'll get to that. Book Expo had twice the amount of space because they really went all out. You had everything there. BookCon had half of the convention space on the upper floor and then a lot of the meeting rooms downstairs for panels and whatnot. Book Expo's lines for like autograph session sessions or at the booth autograph signings were surprisingly well run considering the amount of people who waited in those lines. Like they really figured out how to keep traffic flowing through the aisles, how to snake the lines around turns and towards the edges so that even if people were waiting for an hour before a signing and you had 110, the signings and stuff start a little later. To get books signed for BookCon, you had to go to the bookstore. So they just had a whole row of tables lined up with all the books that are going to be signed at the autograph tables. In concept, that seemed like a very smooth way of doing it. Like all of the books are there. You can see all the stuff that's going to be signed. So you will you can just grab all of them in one go and then get them signed as you as the time allows. Where it slightly fell apart or became complicated is that everyone went to get the books first thing Saturday morning. Because you think, OK, if you have 10 books you want signed, say, go all out, 10 books throughout Saturday and Sunday, you can get all 10 Saturday morning. Do it first thing, and then you're free to wander and do whatever you want the rest of the weekend. If everyone does that, there's going to be a mob in front of the bookstore while everyone tries to do that. So you would think, OK, well, create a long snaking line or something space efficient to manage all those people. I don't know what the system was. I don't know how prepared they were or what didn't quite work. But we get there. We line up. Greetings and salutations, viewers and listeners out there. Welcome to... Not the Word Ninjas Live podcast, because, hey, it's a Monday. But, hey, we just survived both Book Expo America and BookCon 2015. So, seeing as I somehow survived all four and a half days of literary ridiculousness, I thought I'd do a quick review and then do the full book haul. That's kind of why my setup is slightly shifted more to the right of my desk as usual, because I am completely out of space here. I have, I believe, 46 books on this table, or desk, next to me that we get to go through. But first things first. Book Expo America 2015 was a blast. It was surprisingly well run. Now, I don't want that to be some sort of underhanded comment. It was, for that amount of people, that amount of vendors, all the stuff that was going on, I was legitimately impressed at how smoothly everything was handled and how well they were able to accommodate that many people. I was impressed. And between, let's see, I don't even know how many vendors there were. I didn't think to count, but you had all of the big players, the big four, of course. You had all of, you had a fair amount of 200, 300 people in line. They still made it work, which was fantastic. Like there were a few book signings, I believe Thursday, where I waited a solid hour and a half for one particular book. At like 45 minutes before the book signing was supposed to start, I got in line and I was already like 75 people back or something ridiculous like that. I thought that was dedication. BookCon put that to shame. 
the people in the industry have priorities. A more either you're there for networking, so you're going from not quite sure what that is. Sorry, you're going from contact to contact that you're aiming to talk to because you have a whole thing set out, or you're there to get galleys and arcs and signings and stuff for whatever it is you do, whether you're a blogger, you're a librarian, you're a retailer, you're a wholesaler, whatever your deal is, you have priorities. BookCon is open to the public. So the public has a significantly different priority set than those in the industry. I did not take that into consideration. BookCon was ridiculous in that you show up at, say, 8 o'clock in the morning, the exhibit hall opens